the sense of self in the brain is a physiological thing. It is a requirement for your survival. And so your brain creates this laundry list of things like, I am my body. I am the people around me. I am the things that I care about. I am this project at work. You know, all the things that are connected with your existence and your ability to go on from one day into the next is then becoming your sense of self. And this is your false self. This is the ego that everybody talks about in all the ancient writings, et cetera. You're currently listening to Sean Webb. He's the author of one of the, one of the most influential books that I've read this far. It's called Mind Hacking Happiness. And it has so much science, so much detail, so many techniques that you can use that it actually has two volumes. It's like 1,500 pages. Uh, but I recommend you listening to Audible. It is two versions. Like I said, the first version is red, the red copy, and the second version is the blue copy. Remember that, so that way you get the first one, uh, the first book first, obviously. Uh, but very influential. Uh, mind Hacking Happiness teaches you techniques to kind of turn your mind around on itself and build a very high emotional intelligence about what the self is, what the fake self is, what the false self, what the ego really and truly is, and how it's tricking us into thinking that it's in control of our everyday thoughts and our beings. And because of Sean, I've actually picked up and tried to study a little bit of the Zen methods of meditation. And I've actually recently bought this book called Dropping Ashes on the Buddha, the teaching of Zen master Sun San. I guess that's how you say it, guys. I'm not 100%. I'm probably the worst person at um, pronouncing names anyway. But I wanted to read an excerpt for you just to kind of understand what this book is about. So one day a student from Chicago came to the Providence Zen Center and asked Sun San, what is Zen? Sun Sa held his Zen stick above his head and said, do you understand? The student said, I don't know. Sun Sa said, this don't know mind is you. Zen is understanding yourself. And the student said, what do you understand about me? Teach me. Sun Sa said, in a cookie factory, different cookies are baked in the shapes of animals, cars, people, and airplanes. They all have different names and forms, but they are all made from the same dough, and they all taste the same. In the same way, all things in the universe, the sun, the moon, the stars, mountains, rivers, people, and so forth, have different names and forms, but they are all made from the same substance. The universe is organized into pairs of opposites, light and darkness, man and woman, sound and silence, good and bad. But all these opposites are mutual because they are made from the same substance. Their names and their forms are different, but their substance is the same. Names and forms are made by your thinking. If you are not thinking and have no attachment to the name and form, then all substance is one. Your don't know mind cuts off all thinking. This is your substance. The, subst the substance of this Zen stick and your own substance are the same. You are this stick. This stick is you. I don't even know what that means, but I love the idea behind it, like clearing your thoughts out, not having any thoughts and being one with the world, that our substance is connected with everything. I love the idea. I love Sean's book because it teaches emotional intelligence. It teaches how to turn the brain in on itself and relax those crazy, crazy voices in your head that are going a mile a minute that you think is you, but it's not you. It's really the false self trying to control you, <laughs> but I love this interview because Sean, man, you're Sean, you are so good at what you do as far as teaching people like me who need help and realizing that we can control our emotions. We can have a higher emotional intelligence. And when we learn that, when we become aware to that, like we can change our lives. And thank you so much for writing this book. And I hope you guys go out and pick it up because it really, you need to right now buy it and support Sean's mission. So that way he can spread it and scale it to the world. Um, if you guys want to reach out to him, you can do that by following him on social media. His name is Sean Webb. You can also go to his website at mindhackinghappiness.com. Leave him a message, sign up for his email list. Um, and he also has a podcast, Two Seals and a Walrus, which I think is great because it has a lot of great information like in the book that is um, you know, accessible to you guys. Uh, on that platform so check them out on the podcast two seals and a walrus guys i'm excited about this conversation so without further ado here is sean webb i am sean webb and this is your superior self sean i want to say 
it's an honor. It, it is. I'm excited to have you on the show. This is something that I've been looking forward to, and I'm I'm so excited that we finally got to you know land something on our calendars. Thank you, buddy, for joining the show. No, I've really appreciated it. It's been awesome to uh, interact with you a little bit and finally figure out a time on the calendar that worked for us. <laughs> I know you, your your family have been taken down by the uh, flu or or the bacteria that's been going around. But man, dude, like this is. I've been reading your book. Um, when I got it, the free audio. Uh, audible version. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I was kind of like, you know, I was very interested. The uh, the title, Mind Hacking Happiness, definitely piqued my interest. And I started listening to it uh, and I couldn't stop listening. One, you do a, <laughs> you do a fantastic job of actually, I, I don't feel like you're reading. I feel like you're just talking, having a conversation. Well, thanks, man. I really appreciate that. You know, I, I wrote the book about three times before I actually got to a point where I could release it. And it was because I was trying to use like a non-authentic voice the first couple of times, I mm -hmm. think, mm -hmm. where I was, you know, the first time it was like, oh, I'm supposed to be this whatever guru of the mind and telling people how their negativity works and being able to strip it out of their lives, et cetera. And so I was that guy, which wasn't me. And so I wound up tossing that out the window. And then the next attempt was, you know, coming at it from the academic side, because all of this science basically piled on top of what I had put together previously to say, oh, by the way, you're a hundred percent correct. <laughs> you know, Mr. <laughs> Webb on your pontifications. And so then that didn't work because I was trying to be some, you know, science minded dude that just wasn't talking to a regular audience. Mm -hmm. And so I threw that one out. And finally, I just kind of put a picture up on the wall. And I was like, you know, if I'm sitting with these people over a couple of beers somewhere at a bar or whatever, how do I tell them how their mind works and how to turn off their negative stuff and improve their life basically without any changing any of their external conditions, which is how, you know, the, the society and the world tells us that we need to chase happiness is to set our external conditions. Happiness equals a house plus spouse plus 2.5 kids plus a certain amount of money plus, you know, vacations plus yada, yada, yada. Well, all that stuff is BS and science proves that it's BS. Well, how do you get there? And so I had to basically put a picture up on the wall and say, I'm talking to this small group of people and I'm saying, here's how your stuff works. And from that point, I think I finally found my voice to say, here's how it works. And you know, here's the, here's the stuff you're going to run into when you try to employ this stuff. Cause your mind's going to try to work against you changing it. And here's why, and here's the physiological reason why, and here's why you get afraid of things. Here's why you get angry about things. Here's why you get sad about things. And when you look at that, then that throws you into this place called meta awareness, which is a whole group of science connected to that improves your life and your well being and improves your immune system and you know heart rate and blood pressure and all that cool stuff. And then, and then from that point, it was like, okay, now now I'm rolling. Now I can now I've found my voice and now I can just talk to people, which is cool. Mm, what's your background like? What got you into this this type of science? Well, you know, I told the story earlier in the red book. It was um, it was kind of an accident that. I was on that path of trying to change my life's external conditions because I grew up like really poor. And so, you know, I basically had no assistance in going to college or, you know, getting any type of education under me. So I went to the military. I used the GI Bill to go to college. I got hooked up with a one, basically the leading supercomputing company in the world at the time and got hired right before I even left college. And so I had an amazing job going into corporate America. And I had a great deal of financial success because I was able to figure some tech things out and stuff. I had, you know, luck early on in my days of just kind of falling into the right place. And I had the security clearance from the military background. So it's like I get pushed directly up to some of the top jobs that were working with classified information and things like that and supercomputing, which is like the world's leading bleeding edge stuff at that point. So I got lucky and I made a bunch of money and I'm standing on the front porch of my house in suburban Atlanta on a double lot in a upper class, middle class neighborhood. And I'm thinking, you know, I've got all this stuff that American dream tells me I'm supposed to have. I have the great relationships, I have the good relationship with higher power. I've got all of this money. I've got the, you know, the convertible 69 Firebird convertible out in the in the driveway, the Jeep Grand Cherokee, the speedboat, the fast motorcycle, the friends coming over for the party that night, waiting for the in, the stereo installers to install the amazing system that afternoon. And I'm looking out over the whole thing, think, thinking just like, what's next? Mm -hmm. And that little innocent thought really was the first domino to help 
topple all the rest of the dominoes to say, wait a second, I have everything that I supposedly was to attain to gather this thing called happiness. And here I am on the cusp of having it all asking what else do I need? Because there must be, if I'm asking that question, there must be a gap. There must be some hole to fill. There must be something else. And so I stepped back and I said, okay, let's look at that. Because, you know, I've certainly outperformed all the people that I graduated high school with. I've probably outperformed in the, in the last 10 years, the people that I graduated college with. I've got all the success. I've got a trajectory that's just going up. Um, so that can, that's going to continue, but I'm not really looking forward to that. And it's not, delivering me happiness. So then I had to basically take a step back in to say, okay, what is my happiness all about? And what are the things that are blocking me from that happiness? And what is it that I've missed? What's the bigger piece that I've missed? Because it's not going to be another trip to Vegas or season tickets or, you know, whatever it is that's going to fill that hole. And for me to say, oh, finally, I'm happy, right? <clears throat> so I basically stepped back, started reading a lot of global texts and started meditating because I found this book on T DT Suzuki's introduction to Zen and I started meditating. And from there I discovered a whole new realm of your mind. Like you think your mind is vast and intelligent and has a lot of power, et cetera. Well, when you start to basically turn that power back in on itself to start to manage what the mind is doing, a whole nother set of disciplines and abilities and benefits open up for you in that space. And so I kind of discovered that I figured out how my personal pain worked, my personal process of creating pain and the things that were lacking inside my own mind, et cetera. And so I was able to put together a model to kind of explain that to myself. And then I just started to share that model with other folks and they were like, well, wow, that's kind of how my mind works too. So I thought, well, that's interesting. So then I went, up to one of the world's leading experts at MIT who spoke on the stage of TED about this stuff, about emotional intelligence, about emotions for computing, things like that. And she's, it's her job, Ross Picard, to look at all these models to decide what model could be used for artificial emotional intelligence, et cetera. And I said, okay, what's the book that I missed? What's, you know, who's the expert on this that wrote about it that just no one knows and it's on a dusty shelf somewhere, but it's all figured out, et cetera. And she's mm -hmm. like, no, there isn't one. And this model is probably the most elegant model of the cognitive catalysis of human emotion that I've ever seen. And you need to publish it immediately because if somebody with a PhD who needs a, a stick in the ground finds it, they're going to steal it. Hmm. And so we had a whole conversation about that, about how backstabbing the uh, higher level <laughs> academic community is, which was really interesting. Because mm -hmm. I thought those were folks who are just supposed to follow where the evidence leads. Evidently not. Yeah, I'm uh, sure. Yeah. And so then I started down this path of, all right, how do I then explain this to folks? Like I figured out how the human mind works. I figured out how emotions work. I figured out the variables that come together to create your entire emotional landscape. I figured out how to tweak those things so that you can then control your entire emotional landscape. How do I then put that into a book or something? And so that's when I started that whole process. Mm. So your story, I mean, book one is basically building the foundation up into book two, right. and, but you didn't have it easy, right? Like you, you talked about some, some very vulnerable parts in the book about, you know, your experience with your mother and, and what you had to go through with that and, and overcoming that, um, that journey just, it just seems like, I mean, you didn't have it easy, man. Like, I mean, it, people would listen to this and are like, you know, he had, he had the car, he had the house, he had the wife, he had the, the salary. Like people hear that and they're like, oh, well, they, they can do whatever they want because they have the uh, the luxury of having those things. And it's not that like you had to work your way up to where you were at. And then when you got there, you realized that you weren't necessarily happy um, internally. And then yeah. that's when you started your journey with research and, and finding Zen. And, and you had a you had an experience, right? Like a, a I don't I don't know how to explain it, but you had some type of like conscious, unconscious experience, right? Yes. And what it is, is I, I dug into the, the brain research after discovering this experience within. And by the way, discovery is always coming from within. Even Einstein points out to us that, you know, you never solve a problem 
from your waking awareness. It's always you sit with a problem, you think about a problem, and then you let it churn. And then the answer comes from within. And I started to discover after doing some research that the higher levels of intelligence that we have are actually in the subconscious layers of our mind, where uh, they've even proven in this in um, studies where they give people a task and they say, OK, we're going to give you a, a judgment task. And they take two groups of people. They said, OK, you focus on this task the whole time and then we're going to ask you for an answer at the end. And then they take the second group and they say, OK, you guys, we're going to give you this same task, but then we're going to distract you for a little bit. And we're going to give you a, like a number sequencing thing or something that you have to think about. And then right at the very end of when you finish that, we're going to ask you for the answer to the, the first question. And the second group who let their subconscious mind think about it because they watched their brain, they watched the fMRI, et cetera. And the same portion of the brain that these people were using to work on the problem the whole time was also working on the problem with the second group who was distracted. But the people who were distracted gave a, like a night and day better answer over the folks who had concentrated it on it the whole time because their subconscious awareness was able to work and work its magic and it's actually more intelligent than we are. Well, <clears throat> when you dive into your mind and you find those places that you can access that higher level of intelligence, hold, a whole different awareness starts to pop into your existence. And there is a high level of intelligence in there that you can have access to. And if you think about it, like the, the farther down into our mind we go and the farther down into our body we go, the more intelligent it gets. Like two individual cells eventually come together between mom and dad and create a brand new human being that can be independent of mom within nine months, including the most you know, complex tool that we have in the universe, a human brain, our human mind to create the ability for us to grow and learn and be and do and yada, yada, yada. Two individual cells have that intelligence, right? So at the point that you can kind of turn off your waking awareness or alter your perceptions and alter your focus of where your attention is, then you start to gain access to that amazing level of intelligence. And so I'm starting to understand the, the brain science of this thing that we have historically called enlightenment or an enlightenment experience or an awakening experience. This goes back to William James and his um, varieties of religious experience um, where he started talking about a unit of experiences and we started classifying these things. You know, does it have X, Y, Z? Then we can uh, um, classify this as a, a unitive or expansive experience. But this stuff has been written about for centuries. And in fact, a lot of the early religious godheads, this is what they were trying to teach in that became their religion after that. But there's a place in the human mind that you can go, which opens up the doorways to all of this amazing high level, high intelligence, high wisdom stuff that you didn't even know what you had access to. And so, yeah, I, through meditation, I found this doorway into this space that then opened up all of these other abilities or, or possibilities within my own mind. And I started to develop that and that became my ability to understand, you know, kind of how the human mind works and how emotions come to be and what the variables are and how to tweak those and how to take control of those. And then uh, ultimately how to transcend that whole negative emotion experience where, you know, you can hit a button in your brain and literally turn off your, your negative reactivity and in real time. I mean, and, and they've shown this in an fMRI. I mean, this is real scientifically backed stuff. There's no woo woo here connected with the, you know, oh, the, the awakening and now my life is amazing. Well, there's a whole bunch of brain science that you can actually pin to every bit of the stuff that I talk about in Mind Hacking Happiness, and I ex try to explain that science. But yeah, it was a, originally it was an organic discovery within my own mind that helped me put together the answers that I, that, you know, is kind of, are working for a lot of folks at least. Mm. So like, what, you, were you meditating at the time or mm -hmm. was it like just, I don't know, you were doing something out of the, you know, a regular day, a regular schedule and all of a sudden it hit you? No, I was meditating and I went into the meditation with the concentration on, it was a, a little like a Zen Mondo and I'm not truly like a Zen guy. I was just reading this Zen book that helped me understand that these, this group of Zen practitioners believe that when you cease conscious thought in the mind, then the mind can open up and answer mm -hmm. all the questions in the universe. And that's kind of cool. And that this, there's science that actually supports that your neurons are made of microtubules and microtubules actually can reach out into the quantum field. And you may be accessing a data structure within the quantum field that has all the in, infinite 
uh, intelligence of the universe, and that's like rock hard science that mm -hmm. they discovered that in Tsukuba, Japan. But um, yeah, I was meditating to try and stop my conscious thought. And what I was thinking about was, um, I think it was a, a student asked uh, Yeshuan, what does one do while meditating? And the master said, one thinks of not thinking. And then the student asked, how does one think of not thinking? And the master's reply was, of course, by not thinking, <laughs> right? So it was like a really simple response to a question, but it was really, you know, a kind of a telltale direction pointing, go do that, you mm -hmm. know, type of thing. Like, I can't give you the answer. You have to do this yourself. And what that does, and so I went into the meditation thinking, okay, well, I, I got to stop my mind from thinking. And I, and I know that um, thoughts are include you know, images, include sounds, include anything that your mind is creating. And so at any point that a thought tried to arise within my mind, I would try to stop it from occurring or at least focus on clearing my mind again and not having it give any activity. And it makes sense from a neurological standpoint that when your brain patterns stop, when your normal brain patterns stop and you, you do any research on the um, default mode network and you know when you turn down your happiness by 20 percent when you let this portion of your mind fire up it's firing up 53 percent of your day by the way um, when you can take that and turn it off then different brain patterns can arise and different connections can be made than a, that are normal mm. uh, in a any waking day and so that basically happened within my mind i found a, a point of quietude that my mind literally stopped and there was absolutely nothing going on and it was complete silence and that's when the whole other process started where the other patterns of waves emerged that brought me into this experience that allowed for accessing a super level of intelligence that you don't normally don't have access to and a higher level of wisdom that you normally don't have access to and the multiple layers of subconscious that exist within your brain and you know we know that multiple layers of your consciousness exist with split brain patients you get the corpus callosum left hand or left mm -hmm. brain can't talk to the right brain you ask them what they want to do when they grow up and one side you know your one hand is riding doctor and your other hand is riding race car because there are two people up there mm -hmm. You were basically trying to answer the same question and you wouldn't be able to laugh at your own jokes if there wasn't more than one person up there because there's somebody who's telling the joke and somebody who's laughing at the joke, you know, because he didn't know the joke beforehand when the other funny guy said it, right? So we know there are multiple levels of subconscious up there. Well, when you start gaining access to those guys' intelligence levels and wisdom levels and, you know, the, the group speak um, gets re reduced down into the one massive intelligent, wise, um, compassionate being down well below your waking awareness, man, when you gain access to that more often, then all bets are off on the limitations that you had um, as a human being here on this planet. So that happened, and then you were able to research more into this, and then that's when the, the knowledge from di the different research came together for you to write this book. Yeah, exactly. Because um, it used to be theory, like – from the time I had this experience 20 years ago to about 2007, it was all theory. And it was, hmm, that's interesting when I spoke to the uh, the science folks connected with it. And they were like, well, so this seems pretty accurate. But then between 2007 and 2012, about 90 to 95% of the model that I put together was proven absolutely correct. Hmm. And then after that, from 2012 to 2016, the little bits and pieces that weren't proven out were proven out and now I get to go to the science conferences and speak about this stuff. I get to uh, hobnob with these other world-leading scientists about uh, consciousness and the human mind and stuff like that. It's kind of a cool experience for me, you know, being no one coming out of from left field, saying, "Oh, by the way, this is how this whole thing works," and all the science is pointing that it's actually workable. And oh, by the way, it's really practical, and people are actually changing their lives with it. So we That's may awesome. want to just talk about what this model can offer and they're like dude let's do it and you're doing work with the seals too <clears throat> yeah yeah it's in fact a couple of the seals that uh found the book early said let's hang out because they live not too far from me and we're doing a podcast now two seals and a walrus warning <laughs> it's an adult podcast <laughs> these guys are raw but they are pro consciousness they're pro improving your life and so we've been hanging out how, how many episodes do you have uh i think we're up to 22 or 23 mm -hmm. um 
we're interviewing uh, Randall Carlson again here this weekend, I think, to That's go awesome. up pretty soon. Are you, yeah, are He's you everywhere? Joe Rogan's favorite. Are, are you guys everywhere? Um, we try to be. You know, uh, I we've got it up on. Hold on, I think Stitcher Joe Rogan and, mentioned your podcast on one of his episodes, didn't he? I, I could have swore that he did. Oh my god, that would be amazing. I, I don't think know. He did, yeah, because I remember him saying something. He was, I, I don't. It was fairly recent. I remember him saying it, and it just clicked when you said it. Two seals in a walrus. I'm like, I think he did say something like that. That's to amazing. Me, I, I, gotta, I gotta scour all his episodes yeah, now. <laughs> absolutely. Um, so, is there any way, like, to explain the basics? Right. Like, so you have, um, mm, like, everybody lives in the in the false self, right? The, the ego. Everybody thinks yeah. that that's who they are. Yeah. And it's it's just not. Um, no. I've re I'm reading a couple books that I'm, I'm I don't want to mess it up because it's like it, it's very similar to what you're talking about, and I don't want to step on your toes so is there any basics that you can explain to my listeners about what your philosophy is sure um and this is and you don't worry about stepping on my toes by the way because this truth that we're talking about here today is the same truth that just about every other um you know guru of ancient discipline or mind methodology is going to lead you to right and so you just want to use the best tools that are available for you. Like, you know, my friend Ming Tan, he put out a program inside Google called Search Inside Yourself, which became the largest internal mindfulness meditation program inside Google. It's the number one program that they have. It's the one program that Google says they're going to indefinitely support. And then they allowed Meng to wrap it out into a nonprofit external of Google with the same name, like they gave him legal rights and the whole thing. And they're focused on meditation um, and listening and, and going into your mind and using meta awareness that way, turning your mind back in on itself to see what your mind is doing and just be in that place where you can just observe it. And a lot of people that works for, but some people it doesn't like, you know, a lot of people say I can't meditate. And so what I provide is an alternative path that gives you the same benefits of meditation, but at the same time just kind of explains how your mind works and how that works is really simple, by the way. There are only two variables that come together to create every one of your emotional reactions in your life. And so if you think about it, your mind creates your entire life, right? It can re it creates all the happiness. Like even if you try to set all your con external conditions and you wind up winning the lottery or whatever it is, that external condition clicks a button in your mind that says, okay, finally, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to trickle out some happiness to you from under the happiness room door. Well, when you learn how your mind works and you get all the keys to your mind, you can kick that door in at any time and go get all the happiness you want by simply understanding how your mind works. There are two variables that create every bit of your reaction of life. One is your expectation or preference about the next moment, which is directly connected to something called yourself, and I'll explain that in a second. And then the other one is your perception of what's going on around you, um, including like the head nods on your nude news feed or something that someone just said or um, your thoughts on uh, something that happened to you at work today. Well, those two things get measured. And when they're in balance, you get a positive emotion about it. If they're in out of balance, then you get a negative emotion about it. And at the point that you start playing with those variables, you can literally play with your emotional landscape for the rest of your life. Now, the, the, the science behind the expectation or preference is really simple. It comes from the things that in your life you are attached to and that become a sense of your world, of your existence, of your life. Now, it used to be thought that our sense of self was just the body. And <clears throat> the reason that the sense of self has to be there in the first place is you've got this thing called your limbic system, which constantly scans your environments for threats and helps create your perceptions. And it says, is this person a threat? Is this bear coming out of the woods a threat? Or uh, is this headline a threat? Is this uh, baseball flying in my head a threat? Well, then a second question must be asked, a threat to what? And this is where your sense of self comes in. This is where your false self comes in, because this is basically your brain's laundry list of things of what you are and what you're not, because you need to be able to use your energy wisely to survive from first day into the next. So if you see a leaf cutter ant crawling up your wall, you need to know whether you have leaves or not to find out whether that's a threat, to find out whether you need to expend the energy, because if you're defending against all potential threats, you're going to wind up you know, losing energy and, and dying because you've expended all your energy running away from stuff that doesn't really threaten you. So the sense of self in the brain is a physiological thing. It is a requirement for your survival. And so your brain creates this laundry list of things like, I am my body. I am the people around me. 
I am the things that I care about. I am this project at work. You know, all the things that are connected with your existence and your ability to go on from one day into the next is then becoming your sense of self. And this is your false self. This is the ego that everybody talks about in all the ancient writings, et cetera. Well, Jim Cohn showed us that it goes past just the body at the University of Virginia when he put a couple of groups in an fMRI or a group in an fMRI and he said, okay, we're gonna give you a, a flash of light, we're gonna wait, measure your brain, and then we're gonna zap your ankle. And so then he got exactly what he expected in the pause in between, which he flashed the light, he watched the brain, fear center lit up, like people are like, holy crap, I'm gonna get zapped, right? Um, but then he brought a second person into the room and said, okay, we're gonna take the ankle zapper off of you, we're gonna put it on the stranger, we're gonna give you the flash of light, we're gonna watch your brain, but they're gonna really zap somebody you don't know. And they got exactly what they expected there because they were thinking, okay, the sense of self is just the body and we're going to zap somebody else so we're not gonna see any fear and that's exactly what they saw. But the third portion of the experiment was where they changed the world and our understanding of why we can have individual emotions about individual things that are important to us. They brought somebody in who is a familiar and they said, okay, we're gonna zap this person that you love because psychology's word for, you know, someone that's close to you is a familiar, it's a significant other, a spouse, a child, a good friend, a coworker, whatever it is. We're gonna bring that person in, we're gonna give you the flash of light, we're gonna to pause to watch your brain, and then we're gonna zap them, someone you love. And they were expecting no fear because it's no sense of self connected with your body, but what they found was they couldn't tell the first scan and the third scan apart, mm. which means your sense of self in your mind writes the people that you love onto your sense of self. So they're part of your sense map, your self map, which is why you can be angry about somebody attacking you, calling you a name, or you can be angry about somebody calling someone you love a name. It's the same circuitry that's firing within your mind. And so now the importance of the self map goes exponential because now all the things on your self map get an expectation or preference connected with them that they must be held at status quo or increased in value or we're going to have a problem. Mm -hmm. So now you have something that you can play with that, well, Maybe you were really attached to your favorite show on Netflix a lot yesterday, but maybe now if you don't want to have the fallout of it being canceled this next season, you release the amount that you're attached to that show. Or you take some of the things off of your self map, like one of the things that I took off my self map uh, a number of years ago is politics. Um, you know, it, there's a point where you get driven so crazy by what one side or the other does during any portion of your day that you're looking on your news feed and it's creating a negative emotional reaction within you that if you just took that thing off and you realize, well, maybe, you know, both sides are probably uh, g governed by the people who are writing their legislation, which are the private industry folks and both sides uh, have the same level of corruption and yada, yada, yada. Maybe if I just take that off my map, man, the amount of stress that I removed from my life by simply taking politics off of my self map was amazing because then I could look at all the, the Facebook title posts or uh, headlines or whatever it is and not have a reaction mm -hmm. to those things, which is awesome. So now you've got a whole science of whether, you know, you can sweep your self map clean or you can, you know, be mindful about the things that you want to be attached to and keep the important things on there and take the meaningless things off. But then also um, you can create, you can take your perceptions and change those as well. So now you've got two variables that you can use to start basically manipulating your own emotional landscape for the rest of your life. But when you start to adjust your self map, the false self, the ego, and you start to realize that there's a process that creates your emotional output in the first place, your reactions to life in the first place, that does two amazing things by itself as well. One, it gives you a little distance between you and the mess that's been going on. So now beyond you just being the mess, your mind says, wait a second, I was this mess yesterday and now I'm this mess and the awareness of this mess. And your sense of self expands outward a little bit mm -hmm. because the portion of your brain that's in charge of keeping your self map accurate because it's so important that if, if it's inaccurate, you could die if it miscalculates. Um, it now says, well, wait a second, I was this mess yesterday. Now I'm this mess and this awareness, and the more you do that, the bigger your sense of self becomes, and there's a whole ton of studies about awe and about um, creating a larger sense of, of your existence and that you become bigger than your problems, et cetera. Well, basically, a little life problem rock comes in and splashes and makes you feel small when your sense of self is small, and it might shift your boats or rock your boats or sink one of your boats, which could be your relationship or your job or whatever it is. Well, now if your sense of self is expanded out into a pond or out into a lake or out into an ocean, 
that simple problem rock that used to splash and make you feel small. Now you don't even notice the ripples. Your boats don't even rock at all because your sense of self is much grander. And then the other thing it does is um, out in 2007, uh, there was a guy, Matt Lieberman, who discovered the name attainment process, which is when you have an emotional response and you simply put a cognitive understanding to that response of they put people in an fMRI and they said, okay, we're going to give you some pictures. And they looked at their brain and they said, okay, because of the mirror neurons, because of the empathy circuits, when they saw somebody that was angry or afraid or something, then the brain goes, oh, should we be afraid too? Is there something around here that needs to be afraid? Well, that fired their circuits. They put a second group in and said, okay, we want you to look at these same pictures, but we want you to name the emotion in play. And in the second group, that literally turned off the emotion in real time in their brain. If you think about this, this is the same stuff that happens when you walk by like a, a coil on the ground, like a, uh, where your brain thinks it's a snake and you jump because your limbic system saying, hey, oh my God, there's a threat. You look down and you see it's a hose. Well, your thinking brain has said, okay, I've reassessed the situation and now you need to understand, Mr. Fear Brain, mm -hmm. that it's not something we need to be fearful of. And so turn off, quit sending us the fear. And that's a cognitive understanding of the process of what's going on, sends a trigger back to your emotional brain and says, okay, we've resolved this issue. Don't bring it up anymore. And it's not like you bring up that fear tomorrow. It's not like you bring up that fear two hours from now. It is resolved and it is over and that situation is taken care of. Well, the same thing happens when you're able to take the, a look at the two variables that create your emotions in the first place or even a complex situation like a a divorce of a 40 year old woman, like you could have so many equations of emotions firing off at the same time about, you know, maybe it's horrible for the kids right now because where there are in school, maybe it's great for her because it was an abusive relationship. Maybe it, she's going to lose a lot of friends because she's now going to be that divorcee where all her friends are, you know, married uh, in, in their suburban lives or whatever. There's going to be a whole mix of emotions. Well, at the point that you can start to look at those things. You create the distance between you and the mess that's created in your mind, so you realize that you're more than your mess. But then also, when you put an understanding to the two variables that have come together to create all that mess, it literally turns off in your mind. And it's resolved. It's not like you're suppressing it and you have to deal with it later. It is a res resolution, just like you'd go through years of counseling to talk about something and get it resolved. It's resolved right there in just a few seconds. It's amazing, amazing stuff. I love it. I, I use it quite a bit. I mean, like you said in that example of a 40-year-old divorcee, I mean, you can go through the laundry list of emotions, but once you, like you said, name and tame it, you can, you can name it, all right, stress. And so you immediately your brain automatically you know eliminates that feeling, right? Yeah. Um, good stuff. I mean, I, I, how do you stay awake to that, right? Like, so how do you... The meta awareness part, like I feel like, you know, I've heard a couple of examples of people falling asleep, going back to the, the ego. And then, I mean, is there something that you can do outside of meditation or maybe meditation is the key to, to being in that meta awareness? No, there's a ton of stuff you can do, actually. Um, and I gave a bunch of examples in the book on how different things that you can do. Like, first of all, just knowing, like just moving from, you know, the adult learning model starts with incompetent uh, unconsciousness or unconscious incompetence, right? Where, where you don't even know what you don't know. You don't even know what you need to learn. And, you know, some of the listeners of this show might be in that boat where they're like, oh, I didn't even know you could manage your brain. I didn't even know there was a magic button you could push to turn off my negativity, right? So they're in the unconscious incompetence phase. But then as soon as they learn about what it is they need to know, they move into an un or a conscious incompetence where they still can't do it, but at least they know they need to learn to do it. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you start reading a book about something, um, or doing some disciplines or things like that. And you work into a conscious competence where you can actually do the things that you didn't even know that you needed to do previously, but you need to think about them. And then after a while, because your brain changes in form and function to help you do the things that you need to do on the planet, like, you know, you learn to play the piano or you learn to shoot a basketball or hit a baseball, or you learn how to do crossword puzzles. Ultimately, your brain changes to help you do that easier um, the same thing happens when you start managing your happiness level and you start turning down your negativity as you move into that space of Tiger Woods or LeBron James where it's just lights out, automatic, happens for you and you wake up in a great mood and you go to bed in a great mood because you're just in a great mood all day. Mm -hmm. Well, there are a number of things that you can do to get there. There's, uh, you know, obviously meditation is one of those things, a number of meta awareness practices that help take your 800 pound gorilla and use it to wrestle the 800 pound gorilla. 
Um, there's, you know, simple tools like using the me, like when you're being hijacked by your emotional uh, turmoil, instead of saying that makes me angry, just change the language a little bit. That makes the me angry. Boom. Right there, when you're saying that makes the me angry, it objectifies your egoic reaction to a place that's not you. It, it makes the me, which is not me, right? It's a, it's a little trick of horrible grammar, uh, <laughs> basically, that throws you into that space of reminding yourself, I am the thing that's beyond my mind. I can use my mind's reactions in a positive way if I need to. Like if you come slap my kid in the face, I'm going to use my anger to put you on the ground, right? <laughs> there's, there's no question I'm going to let that flow. But if it's something that, you know, somebody says about your project at work and they don't really have uh, sway over anything and, no, you know, the bosses don't really care what this person says, then all of a sudden you might be a little angry, but it's like, I'm just going to sidestep that. It's not going to be productive, right? So at the point that you start to use these little tools, then that helps you get into that space of having your conscious competence become an unconscious competence where it's all just automatic over time. But there's a lot of things you can do meditation, you could do journaling, you can do um, positive self-talk, which, by the way, needs to be done in a very specific way because uh, a lot of things that you would say like, oh, I'm good at this or whatever is actually counterintuitive to actually bringing you good results rather than you saying I can be or I can do well on this today or I can try my best today. Right. There are certain things that you need to change with positive self-talk that turn it from a sabotaging self-talk, mm -hmm. which may sound positive into an actual scientifically tested effective way of using self-talk to increase your your productivity your your effic efficacy etc so there are a number of things that you can do that if one doesn't work for you there's always another option for you like a lot of people come to me and say i can't meditate and i'm like great no problem can you identify your expectation or preference and your perception about each thing that has thrown you sideways well yes Okay, well, there you go. There's your step right there. And once you start doing that more and more over time, then your brain starts doing it more and more automatically over time. And you'll find that your emotional reactions that would normally hinder you and make your life less epic become optional. And they become optional at a subconscious level to where your subconscious identifies that this thing may not be useful and just kind of shunts it to ground. And you don't even have to deal with it from a waking awareness standpoint anymore. It doesn't even throw you off keel. Yeah, I'm I'm at the part in the part two where you start talking about the uh, subconscious and the different layers, and it's pretty fascinating stuff. Like I just never even thought about that. Like I, I'm I'm reading right now. I just actually I just got done reading uh, a book called Driven uh, by Dr. Doug. Um, I always say it wrong. It's either Brackman or Brickman, something like that. And um, he talks about the driven mind, where there's like ten to fifteen percent of the world's population has the the mind makeup of the hunter and the gap, you know, the hunter of the gathers. And, um, hold on real quick. Um, and he talks about how predominantly 90% of the world uses their prefrontal cortex where ours is more so in the back. I can't remember what the, the area is called. Um, because we're very visual learners and, um, probably oh, yeah, occipital lobe. Yeah. Yeah. And it takes a lot of dopamine for us to feel the rewards. So like I'm always reward deficient and that's why I go from one thing to the next. Cause I get bored and bored and bored looking for that dopamine. Right. And he talks about sort of the same thing as you where, you know, the, the new brain is the monkeys and the old brain is the elephant. Right. And right. always the monkeys are always trying to control the elephant. Um, the, the elephant's the emotional part and the monkeys are the little voice that tells you you're not good enough. Self-sabotage. Right. And so he does like a meditation system where it's like open eyed because we're visual learners where he'll sit down and meditate open with his eyes open, like on fixated on a candle or something like that. And he does his breathing technique that keeps you in the present instead of worrying about the future. Right. Which is very, it's helped me a lot. But again, I talked to him a little bit, a little bit about this and I was like, you know, it's just staying, you know, aware in that meta awareness of like, you know, I am feeling All right. So I have my wife and myself, myself, Matt, right. And I have this expectation. And when she doesn't maintain that expectation, now my perception changes and that triggers something. So now I have to identify that emotion to neutralize it and then step out of myself and say, why are you feeling like it gives a shit? You know what I mean? Like, right. you know what I mean? exactly. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. but that's an amazingly effective strategy though. Yeah. I mean, when you take 
charge of your mind and what it's doing. And then you look back in on your mind and you ask yourself, basically, why is my mind doing this? That's an amazing tool. That's like one of the, I'm sure if Doug was sitting here, Navy SEAL Doug, who does a podcast with me, he'd be like, good on you, dude. That's an amazing, uh, like next level humanity trait that is going to propel you to your highest levels of efficacy versus the folks who cannot understand why they do something. Mm -hmm. And right? we talked a little bit about uh, teaching that to children. And I... I've tried. I've tried teaching it to my, my kids, or, or at least speaking to them. And they're like, what are you talking about? Because you have an instance in there where you're – in the story, you talk about – I think it was either you, you beat your son at pool or something, ping pong air or hockey. something, air yeah. hockey. And uh, you tried <laughs> to explain it to him. And it was actually a really good explanation. It's just like I, I, I tried to go in that direction with them, and they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Yeah, it's tough to explain to kids and unless you've got a good grasp on it yourself. But the good news is once you get a good grasp on it, you can explain it to anybody. And it just takes a little bit of practice within your own mind to be able to create examples for other people who can then, you know, they can identify with. And so it was easy for me being, you know, one of the guys who helped discover this stuff to be able to explain it to my son. And he gets an immense benefit from having that ability to take his mind and turn turn it back in on his mind and and he sidesteps a lot of his normal nine-year-old problems uh and has become a leader within his class because he's able to help his friends like stay away from cursing for absolutely no reason because it makes him feel cool you know that type of thing like he's counseled these kids out of not really? cursing when the teacher's not around yeah it's amazing it's amazing because you know, he kind of explains to them, you know, why they want to feel cool and maybe that it's not good because, you know, how I explained it to him was, look, look, he's going to feel cool that when you curse around people who are, would get you in trouble. But the problem is when you become plastic to that and you start cursing just because it's habit and then all of a sudden you curse in front of the wrong person and then all of a sudden you become that kid. Mm. Right. So. You might want to be careful with that if you don't want to be that kid. And I gave him the, the choice. I'm like, look, man, it's your life. It's your choice. You can curse when the when the teacher's not around if you want to, but you're going to get caught. I'm telling you, you're going to be that kid eventually. Well, I mean, so I mean, you got kicked out of preschool because of that. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to help him with uh, my own life lessons. And uh, it's amazing that he's actually taking them into account. <laughs> Learn from my mistakes. Oh my god! Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's freaky though, man. Like the to really realize that that ego, that false self, that that the voice in your head that you thought was you for all those years that guided you through your life is not who yeah. you are. Yeah, it's amazing, and I mean, it's liberating, right? You want to talk about liberation and the ancient disciplines that help lead us there. I mean, that's what they're talking about. They're being liberated from the false self of the mind. And you need to understand that, you know, our mind goes beyond just our brain and they're on the cusp of, you know, they've already partially proven that with science, but they're on the cusp of like really breaking through to, you know, definitions of consciousness and how it works, et cetera. Um, and consciousness is part of the quantum mechanics, right? You cannot have a definition of quantum mechanics. Even the Copenhagen version of quantum mechanics says, yeah, consciousness exists, but ignore it, shut up and calculate, right? That's the Copenhagen interpretation. But the reality is that the um, the wave function is collapsed by conscious interaction of some sort. What that, where there's lines of demarcation are, still a little fuzzy. What consciousness is, still a little fuzzy. But consciousness is the thing that allows us to create an existence and have a mind and have our little space within the whole conscious realm. Um, and so, you know, you've got to be able to understand that that's, that's your true existence. And when you understand that your mind's definition of self doesn't run the show, that's a liberation. That's mm -hmm. a holy crap. I don't have to be limited by the rules of this spectrum anymore, by this game, this BS model of existence that isn't, that's based on just what the mind can understand, not reality itself. Because mm -hmm. we're limited in our intelligence and we can only define ourselves by the things that are existing around us. And a lot of times we just want to stop at our skin and say, this is me and all that is something else. And we don't want to exist or we don't want to realize that our whole environment creates our existence. And we had an amazing conversation with Neil Thies just this last week 
on Two Seals and a Walrus about how science proves that you are the whole universe. You There is no line of demarcation where you stop and something else begins. You are the whole thing from a quantum mechanics perspective that creates the matter that creates your whole existence. And so for you to be limited by an idea of a sense of self that defines you as you know, I am this religion or I am this politics or I am this person and somebody else is not me or the, another religion is not me or, you know, my stuff is better or I deserve this lane more than somebody else, then that does nothing but cause you problems. And so at that point, uh, if you can get beyond that, that's liberation from the self period. And that's what Einstein called. Um, you can judge a value of a human being mm. by the, the amount that they've liberated from self. Mm. Yeah, I I totally blew my what my wife's mind uh, the other night, which is very rare. Um, very rare <laughs> do I say something that very interest you know she's interested in. But I was like, do you agree? Uh, I was like sitting on the couch. I was you know we're watching Christmas movies. I was like, Marissa, do you agree that we're energy? She's like, yeah, yeah. I was like, well, quantum physics says that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So explain that one. And then she, she was just like, you know what I mean? Like, she just like, because we were talking about, because I was telling her about your book. I was like, you know, you need to read this. Because like, I always try to push things on her. Like, when I get excited about something, like, right. I'm always like, you need to read this. Um, and I was trying to explain to her your book. And uh, we were talking about it. And I was like, you know, all those times you got mad at me, uh, that wasn't really you. That was just the voices in your head. And that's not real. So you're really not mad. <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's a tough and discussion like, to have what? with your wife <laughs> are you talking about <laughs> um yeah but i mean like i said before like i mean my entire life i i was going off the voice in my head whether this is right or, or wrong or, or i should do this or i should do that or this is my calling this is my calling i should do this and the entire time, I wish I had this information, like where I think your son is so lucky is that he gets to have like he's the human experiment, right? Like to have this at an early age and then, you know, document like how you know, obviously he's your son, you're going to support him. But I mean, like to really sure. see somebody at a young age that has this knowledge, what can they do with it? You know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's... And it's like I, there's half of me that says, should I let him be an independent <laughs> growth of a human being that's, in, you know, kind of put a. Uh, um, some tor sort of uh, like bumper in between yeah. him and yeah. I and his natural progression or should we really use this and because you know this is brand new mind science this is brand new brain science and this is you know stuff that we're just discovering now and uh, confirming with empirical science and fMRIs and things like that um, should I leave him alone or should I make him that, no, no, <laughs> that man, experiment got, for me you gotta test this out <laughs> <laughs> and it, yeah, it's kind of been falling on the, he's, he's the experiment, uh, until I get some negative responses, I think I'll probably continue on that. He's the experiment path That's awesome. because it's been nothing but positive. I mean, he's, he's not exceptionally athletically talented, but at the same time, he's found that work hard level that has allowed him to become the kid who's on the top team playing up a level, beating a, a, you know kids who are a year older than they are because of his determination and because he was able to put down his doubts and his worries and his regrets and things like that and leave that stuff behind him to focus on what, you know, the, the task of the day and to do his best and stuff like that. And so he's playing at a level that's much higher than his physical ability because he has managed the doubts in his mind and the limitations that could get in his way. And he's just that much better of an overall athlete, not because he's faster, he's not, not because he's quicker, he's not, um, just because of his tenacity and his ability to get over his emotional strife. Mm. That's amazing. That's some good stuff. Yeah. I, the, the, the children's book, I think you should definitely pursue, which, um, I would definitely be interested in, in, in reading that for my kid or having my kid read that because that's something, um, you know, my son, I think having that knowledge, they could better get a sense of who they are and not who they are, but like what they are mm -hmm. and, uh, be able to work through a lot of different shit that I couldn't right? like to, yeah. to, to, take those emotions out of it and, and just see it from a, you know, a different point of view.
Yeah. Well, that's the whole reason that I wanted to get this stuff out and why I'm still promoting it is that I want I want to push humanity from humanity 2.0 into humanity 3.0. Mm. Like, I'm not sure if we've, you know, I, like I've, I've been talking to Randall Carlson, so I'm not sure if we used to be a more advanced human species before the comets hit us 12,900 years ago and wiped off half of the megafauna on the planet. I mean, there's some amazing science that's now coming to light with uh, some comets may have just reset humanity uh, 13,000 years ago. But you know, humanity 1.0 after those events, whatever they were, uh, there was, you know, hunter gatherers and crawling out of caves and repopulating the earth. And then humanity 2.0 was us figuring out how to industrialize our food delivery system and our logistics and revolution. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and industrial. And so now we can get a lot of people, a lot of things that they don't have to focus on survival all day long. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's humanity 2.0. I think humanity 3.0 is going to be the, the fact that we take control, the point that we take control of our minds and we no longer are held hostage by our emotional reactions to things that don't really matter when it comes to, our sense of self being inaccurate and can be expanded out into a greater understanding of our humanity and our existence, et cetera. I think there's a point where we stop being assholes and we start being better human beings mm. for not just ourselves and our family, et cetera, but for the rest of the world, et cetera. And for humanity in general, where we do put it to be a priority that everybody gets fed mm. and everybody gets water. And even the folks who may not um, have the ability to take care of a house that we might want to give them or a domicile because they're just they got unlucky and got their brain wiring messed up uh, and and they just can't function as a normal person in society. We take care of those folks. Yeah. Right. We don't say, yeah, oh, sorry, sucks to be you. Go live on the street and here's a here's a tent. You know, it's like we we find a way to take care of those folks and allow them, um, you know, some level of, uh, you know, a, a, an existence that that is enjoyable. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I, and I also like in the book how you have like the, uh, the reviews after each chapter and, and kind of, you know, point out what you've gone over. It really helped me remember a lot of key points uh, and retain a lot of those, um, uh, uh, you know, teachings so that I, I can apply it to my everyday life. Sean, I mean, this is fantastic stuff, man. I, I thank you for writing this book. I mean, and the audible book is, is, is very, um, it's like having a conversation. Like I'm sitting here, you know, like right, right, right now. I feel like we're, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, it's great. Um, what's next for you? Well, um, more podcasts, more online content to help people. Cause I've been, a lot of people reached out to say, Hey, we want, we want to dig deeper. We want more stuff. It's like we get, we get the concepts and we totally believe them cause we're already using them and they're already affecting my life. And, you know, and, and so, some of the stories are amazing by the way. It's like this, this lady came and took me out to lunch in my hometown because she was so gripped by addiction that she was she called herself the poster child of alcoholism where she was um, an affluent wife of a very successful business person in Texas and was just hanging out with her girls drinking wine all day every day didn't realize that she was an addict and then drunk her drunk herself into kind of a brain mush where she actually did damage to her gray matter wound up in a coma in the hospital wound up in the traumatic brain injury ward of a neuroscience hospital. Then after going through rehab, her husband's taken her home, unpacking the bags in the driveway. She's inside pouring herself a glass of wine to take mm. the edge off after that whole ordeal. So she's like, I know addiction and I know how it's how it can grip people. And she um, got a hold of the Red Book somehow. I think her husband had found it and said, hey, you might want to try this. And she read on how to take control of her mind and realized that her addiction issues weren't stemming from the addiction to the substance itself, but it was the pain underneath mm. that she then got in and fixed and then no longer needed the alcohol as a result. And she was like the real deal. She came to me and said, look, I cured myself where I don't like alcohol anymore, but it I then sat down with a glass of wine in a journal and I, I took another glass of wine, the drink that AA says you can never take. And she said, I journaled it. And I, I sat down and I, I journaled my physical effects, my psychological effects, my thoughts during the whole thing, the, what, you know, what it tasted like, uh, what the after effects were. And she goes, I'm done. I don't, I don't really need alcohol anymore and fixed her own alcoholism. I mean, she did it. I'm not taking credit for it because, I mean, after you figure out how your mind works and you take control of the things that create your mind's output, mm -hmm. you can totally change your life. And she did it. And I'm giving her 100% of credit on that. Uh, but that's the kind of cool stuff that can come from 
somebody taking control of their own mind process and their own existence. And it's just so beautiful to see. And so I appreciate that feedback, man. Mm. I, I love doing this stuff and I want to provide more uh, content for people to be able to deepen their um, expertise in taking control of their mind and taking control of their life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this two seals and a walrus thing I'm doing, this mind hacking happiness podcast I'm starting to fire up is, is going to be going. Uh, I'm going to do some more books, uh, focusing on people's implementation. Like I'm sure there's going to be a mind hacking sales book in the future <laughs> or mind hacking parenting or, you know, whatever it is that, uh, people want to read sure. to help improve their, their individual lives. We'll see, but That's awesome, uh, this man. is going to be my path for the rest of my life. That's I'm pretty awesome. sure. Um, yeah, but I mean, like you do, you know, thousands of hours of research and, and research the science. And then this, this lady comes to your hometown and takes you out to lunch saying that you changed your research, your effort, all those hours and you, you put it into a book and it changes someone's life. I mean, that's got to feel incredible. Yeah. It's awesome. I it's mean, awesome. I mean, it makes the whole thing worthwhile, right? I mean, I, you, you, you have this amazing thing that happens within you and it changes your own life for the better, which is awesome. I mean, it's just, if it stops right there, it's perfect. But then when you can figure out something that has happened to you that can apply to someone else's life and then it changes their life to make their life awesome as well. I mean, and, and you start to think about all the people that you can touch then. I mean, and you know, so if the people in the audience are, are authors and you can touch somebody's life positively, then all of a sudden you're touching their kids' lives positively, the people around them, you know, that type of thing, which is amazing. Or if you can just find a cool book that you can suggest, <laughs> although this sounds like I'm trying to promote my own book, but if you can find something like whatever you can do to touch somebody else, to then have them touch somebody else's life and make the whole world better, we're moving the dial on happiness and on, you know, getting to humanity 3.0 at that point. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's an amazing feeling. Mm -hmm. And so whatever you can do, like the more you can fill your life with making amazing suggestions for people or helping to see them, have them see things in a different light that then help other people that they touch do the same thing. I mean, how could you live a better life? And the best part is that like, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but like Declan's kids, their kids are going to be listening to this. Like that's, that's, you know, pop up Sean, you know, like he, that's yeah. going to be, that's going to be so valuable to your, I mean, your grandkids, your great grandkids. I mean, it's, it's yeah. crazy. And to my great grandkids, even though I never met you, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, I mean, in, in this communication age where we have the ability to reach through time and to reach through generations. And I mean, you know, one of the one of the things that is high on my list of things to do that if I ever had access to time travel is to go back and eliminate the guy that burned the library at Alexandria. Mm, or at Alexandria. Yeah, that, that, would. yeah that, that would be one of my uh, one of my top tens that I would want to go do. Uh, I think it's amazing that we can be in this age where we're starting to share things that will transcend our physical existence here on the planet or our personal physical existence and touch others in a way that um, we couldn't before. Mm. How can people connect with you, Sean? Well, you can check out mindhackinghabitus.com uh, is a good website that gets you some videos and some decent links and uh, the stuff that I've done on the internet. Um, uh, definitely check out the books if you're interested in improving your control of your mind and how to take control of your life and make things better without having to change any of your external conditions. You can get that stuff at Amazon or uh, Audible. I wrote, uh, read my own book at Audible. Um, amazing, you can check out the, amazing, by the way. Oh, thanks, man. I really appreciate it. I worked hard on that. I wanted it to sound. Well, I, you know, I like it's the like, second one um, at the very beginning when you had Declan come on and uh, actually read. Oh yeah, uh, that was amazing. I like that. Yeah. That uh -huh. was really cool. He wanted to be a part of it. He wants to be a part of everything. That's I, awesome. I kind of let him sometimes. That's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, I did a podcast one time with my kids, um, just joking around. But I, I think it's you know the, the the idea that they'll be able to listen to it you know years from now. You know, we, we when we were kids, we had photos. You know what I mean? Like, but now it's so the technology is just you know exponentially growing. Where we can use the audio and the videos and everything like that. Where we can document and be able to show them when they're older. I mean, it's fascinating. Um, yeah. Last question. I know you have to go. Uh, what do you want your legacy to be? I think I kind of know the answer, but like what when it's all said and done with it. What do you want to be remembered, remembered for? You know, if I could just 
have come to this world and then leave it as a better place than it was when I came. Mm. I mean, that's, you know, through everything that I do, through um, having raised better children, you know, I'm a foster parent for the state of that I live in. And um, if I can have a positive effect on those kids that have a po- positive effect on the people that they touch moving forward, if I can have a positive effect on people that I touch, who can have a positive effect on t- people that they touch moving forward. Uh, if we can all learn to take control of our minds and go through our limitations and transcend them, um, that would be an amazing legacy for me. That story, uh, I think it's in book one, right? The How you became a foster parent. Yeah. Oh, it's fascinating, guys. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to spoil it. Um, <laughs> go read it in uh, Mind Hacking Happiness. It's probably the, the most important book that you'll read. Let's make it a 2020 goal um, next year. So, Sean Webb, thank you so much for joining the show, man. This has been fascinating. I'm a big fan, if you can't tell. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Trey. I appreciate it. No, it's, good to, it's good to hook up and, uh, and talk. I want to say thank you to sean webb for joining the show and hanging out with us today this was an amazing interview sean thank you so much for hanging out if you guys want to check me out on social media you can do that at uh let's see facebook trey downs instagram t downs 80 twitter at downs trey go check me out at the website your superior guys this has been amazing thank you so much for hanging out My mind racing, but Katie and change my heart.